all right hello guys uh, thank you for joining in okay so we don't have many people wanting to know about kala sarpa and that's fine because you know we <clears throat> this knowledge is only available to those who are actually meant for it okay anyways let's begin with the shanti mantra as we always do om sahana bhavatu sahana bhunakatu sah vedyankar vavahai तेजस्वीनादीतमस्तु मद विषवह ओं शाति 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 ओके हा सो द लास्ट टाइम वी एक्चुअली यु नो वी एक्चुअली डिस्कस्ड हाउ द ग्रह can be classified as shubha and papa okay so this time you know we'll be actually discussing the the way of the nodes okay so this is very very important because you know jyotisha is all about understanding the nodes okay it's all about understanding the nodes and how they impact our lives all right so you know whereas light has the potential to illuminate our finer qualities shadows have the tendency to reveal the dark side of our human nature okay and what do shadows reveal they reveal our compulsion they reveal our compulsions they reveal our obsessions they reveal our repulsions as well as phobias okay so in this respect you know both rahu and ketu have primal trajectories okay that means they have polarized attributes in a dynamic axis of oppositional activity okay <clears throat> so as i said you know rahu and ketu are always you know rahu and ketu are always retrograde unlike the sun and moon which are never retrograde rahu and ketu are always retrograde okay so you know what that means is they are demonic by their very nature okay uh so rahu is sometimes referred to as you know chala karaka okay what is chala karaka chala means something that is fraudulent or illusory okay chala chala means something that you know that is fraud and uh, you know if you if you use the vedic term the sanskrit term it is defined as anything that is adharmic okay what is adharmic that means which goes against dharma okay which does not follow any moral or ethical perspective so this placement of rahu wherever rahu is placed in the birth chart it is very much symbolic of an animalistic urge for material you know material experience okay and uh, what are the words that optima you know that epitomize the rahuvian experience okay right now because we are having this class using the internet as a medium of communication this is also a rahuvian experience we are having okay this experience is also rahuvian but this is a positive rahuvian experience okay so the knowledge is jupiterian but the experience is very much rahuvian all right so what you know what words are included in the rahuvian experience it includes ambition it includes appetite it includes aspiration it includes craving it includes desire it includes devotion as well okay it includes devotion so this is surprising because rahu is the karaka for mantras you know all mantras are related to the sun and rahu is the karaka for mantras this is very important to understand okay then you have eagerness then you have fascination then you have greed you know then you have hunger then you have lust then you have motive you have need you have passion you have thirst you have wish you have will you have earning so all these words are very very you know are they describe the rahuvian experience okay now ketu who actually lies on the other end of that axis ketu is referred to as the chidra karaka okay chidra means 
you know something that pierces it's very very sharp okay chidra the other word for chidra is shipra okay the other word for chidra is shipra so you know ketu actually is a significator for something that pierces so what it what it means is that in this context we can interpret it as something that cuts through the illusion okay because when you cut through the illusion you actually decline to engage in worldly attractions okay or you can aspire to a higher level of experience okay so what happened was you know when my guru ji he you know he was having this marriage all of a sudden he got an opportunity to become a yogi and you know he left everything out he you know he did not abandon his wife basically he had told her that you know for me my spiritual experience means a lot so he actually you know he actually ended his marriage legally and he went to become a yogi in search of something higher okay in search of a higher level of experience so you know this search for a higher level of experience this urge to you know not to participate in worldly activities it manifests as a spiritual urge for detachment okay so detachment is not vairagya okay nowadays it is a you know nowadays it is a common trend to refer to detachment as vairagya okay it is not vairagya okay and the word vairagya it actually comes from the word vairaga okay vairaga so what is raga raga means your emotions it does not only mean anger people think that raga is anger no raga means the range of emotions that we have as human beings so when you decide not to engage with those emotions you become vairaga so that word has become vairagya okay so ketu does not mean you know ketu does not mean you know not being attached to something it only means you are not attached to your emotions about something okay what causes attachment is our emotions you know we are attached to our families we are attached to our children we are attached to our spouses we are attached to money so all these are you know all these are emotional attachments that we have okay except food all right except food we have all the attachments that we have they are emotional attachments even food is an emotional attachment some kinds of foods are emotional attachments for example sugar is an emotional attachment for example spices are an emotional attachment okay so ketu is the significator of vairagya vairagya means you are not emotionally attached to anything okay that is vairagya that is not detachment okay detachment means a lack of engagement so you may be fully engaged but you may not be attached to something all right and uh, you know just like the rahuvian experience the ketuvian experience is described by words such as ambivalence antagonism antipathy apathy aversion coolness disgust disinclination disinterest okay dislike distaste hatred loathing you know peacefulness repulsion skepticism okay so you know these are the words that describe the ketuvian experience now funny thing is you know ketu makes you reject divinity by its skepticism ketu makes you reject divinity but if you can actually overcome the skepticism of ketu you know if you can overcome the skeptic skepticism of ketu you can actually reach for the ultimate experience that is the reason indian philosophy has a word called neti you know you deny everything i am not the body i am not the mind this is what sadguru tells you okay so you know i am not the body i am not the mind i am not this i am not that so who am i okay this question comes up yes indian philosophy has thrown up this question very very often who am i okay so you know once you overcome this skepticism who am i once you give away all you know all your attachments to things you know you are not your body you are not your mind you are not your job you are not your relationship you are not your profession you are not your career you are not your skills okay so when you give up your attachment to all these things which are not you find that which is okay 
you find out that which is and this is signified by k2 that is the reason k2 they you know k2 it is also the significator of saints and other holy people okay it is also the significator of saints and other holy people all right and later on as we proceed in this journey of understanding the kala sarpa we will see how these two primal trajectories or the forces of compulsion versus repulsion so rahu represents compulsion ketu represents repulsion okay so how these two forces play out in a birth chart depending on the houses occupied by the nodal axis okay so this pattern is discernible in every horoscope okay but it is very very prominent in those where kala sarpa is present okay so any doubts still here this is very important you have to understand the nodes before you can start studying them any doubts still here okay in that case we can proceed further so we come to the karakatva of the you know karakatva of the nodes okay so what is karakatva karakatva implies those things for which a planet is a natural significator okay so each of the navagrahas or the nine planets they are associated with certain people things and circumstances in life okay and uh, you have to you know you have to appreciate not only understand you have to appreciate the karakatva to be you know to understand or to be successful in interpreting a planet's placement in your horoscope okay so what are the horoscopes that you have you have the jataka horoscope jataka is the birth chart the natal birth chart then you have the prashna chart okay and then you have the muhurta chart so wherever this planet is placed it will <clears throat> you know it will it will uh, exert its karakatva okay so we are not going to study the karakatvas of all the planets we are just going to study the you know the general associations of rahu and ketu under several categories okay so this is according to what is mentioned in the brahat parashara hora shastra okay different books have different information but uh, we will go only for the dphs all right so ages okay both rahu and ketu they represent people who are aged between 69 and 108 okay then you know both rahu and ketu they preside over inorganic matter what is inorganic matter for example minerals okay what are minerals known as in in sanskrit they are known as dhatu okay in sanskrit minerals are known as dhatu and both rahu and ketu they represent parasites and vermin okay things that swarm for example ants bacteria cockroaches rodents viruses etc all right and specifically or rather differentially rahu is strongly associated with reptiles and snakes whereas ketu rules dogs okay you know appearance rahu is described as dark complexion fierce looking irascible rheumatic and tall okay these are the appearances all right so rahu appears as someone or something that you are forced to take notice of that you are forced to notice all right on the other hand ketu is tall and excitable okay so both rahu and ketu they can uh, you know in in medical astrology they can signify ailments in uncharted territory you know they can signify ailments which are difficult to diagnose or cure okay and both are related to skin problems for example rahu you know related to mercury or rahu associated with mercury can cause you know uh, blisters or boils on the skin okay and uh, rahu represents the vata dosha okay it represents the vata dosha and uh, vata means air okay so since it represents vata dosha it rules nervous disorders functional irregularities of the body spams spasms that means not spams spasms twitches okay it can reflect epilepsy all right multiple sclerosis 
then uh, fibro, there is a disease I've forgotten. It starts with, I think it's fibromyalgia mm. or something. I don't remember. Okay, Parkinson's disease is. Is, uh, is that fibromyalgia? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I forgot the name completely. Yeah. And then Parkinson's yeah. disease is, is ruled by Rahu. Okay. So, and because Rahu is invisible, Okay, Rahu is invisible. He only has the head. He does not have the body. So it governs illnesses operating behind the scenes, such as ulcers or cancers, you know, that debilitates you from the core, that eats you up from the core. Okay. So, you know, Rahu occupying certain houses in the chart can indicate limbs that are very, very long, especially, you know, if Rahu is present in the ninth or the tenth house, it can indicate long limbs. Okay, but primarily Rahu represents the hands, while Ketu represents the legs. Okay, and Ketu it governs Pitta dosha, and it is associated with boils, uh, problems of uh, bronchial problems, and then burning sensations, cataracts, cuts and wounds, enlargement of spleen, eruptions, and fevers, itches, poisoning, and stomach pains. Okay, so these are all represented by Ketu. Okay. Then the Varna, the Jati. Okay. So Rahu and Ketu, they govern the Malecha. Malecha, it is known as Malecha. Malecha means the outcasts or the misfits of the society. For example, Chandalas, the people who take care of the crematoriums, they are regarded as outcasts. Okay. And uh, particularly Rahu, they Rahu, it governs those who have been rejected by the society, for example, drug addicts. Okay, then there are some societies which are very averse towards homosexuals, lepers, or those who are impaired physically or psychologically. Okay, and by contrast, K2 will have a greater affinity with those who have themselves rejected society, for example, sadhus or saints or wandering hermits. Okay or mendicants and so on, okay? So among the colors, Rahu rules dark blue and smoky colors, okay? It also rules the sky blue color, okay? It, it rules the sky blue color. K2, on the other hand, it rules uh, colors and patterns such as, you know, pastries and uh, plates, okay? <clears throat> the illusory patterns that you see on the wall of a hypnotist that go round and round. And when you look at it, you, you know, it makes you fall sleepy. That is represented by K2. Okay. Uh, among the DTs, Rahu is associated with Nagaraja. Rahu is also associated with, uh, with Durga. Okay. K2, on the other hand, is associated with Ganapati. Okay, Ketu is also associated with Dutra. All right. Among the Mahavidyas, Rahu is represented by Chinnamasta. Okay, so the great goddess Chinnamasta, who does not have a head, she takes Rahu's head and gives him a body. Okay, look at Chinnamasta's iconography. She does not have a head. So she takes Rahu's head and immediately gives the body to Rahu, and that makes it auspicious. Okay, K2, because it is associated with smoke, it represents Thumavati, okay, amongst the Mahavidyas. Now, the funny thing about smoke is, at times you may not see the fire associated with the smoke, okay? But if smoke is there, even though, even though the fire, you know, causing the smoke may not be visible, one thing you can be sure about is that if smoke is there, fire will be somewhere very, very near. Yes, you cannot have smoke without the fire, okay? Then both Rahu and Ketu, they represent junk food and pharmaceuticals, as well as intoxicants and other stimulants, for example, nicotine, alcohol, and other recreational drugs, okay? Just a minute. Yeah, there was someone at
<laughs> okay. So then, <clears throat> by direction, Rahu represents the southwest, which is of course the place of ancestors, while Ketu indicates the northwest. Okay. Again, coming to the diseases, Rahu and Ketu are associated with diseases involving boils, burning sensations, intestinal complaints, leprosy, skin afflictions, enlargement of spleen and ulcers. Okay. And differentially, Rahu is associated with irregularities of adrenals, while Ketu is associated with eruptions and mental disorders. Okay. Amongst the distance, Rahu, BPHS says that Rahu represents long distances. Okay, it is specified as 20 yojanas. All right. So, yojana is something that represents the distance driven at a stretch, which is around four to eight miles. Okay. So, you know, it represents a range of 20 yojanas, will represent a range of 80 to 160 miles. K2 will represent medium distances and you know that is specified as seven yojanas okay so the range will be around 28 to 56 miles so rahu is also you know rahu is also known as the you know as the image of saturn okay so that is the reason it represents air and similarly since k2 behaves like a duplicate mars it actually indicates or it actually rules fire or represents fire okay among relations, Rahu signifies maternal grandparents. Okay. Some books will say it represents paternal grandfather and maternal grandmother. Okay. On the other hand, K2 represents the paternal grandparents in general. And, uh, you know, some astrology texts say it is the K2 represents specifically maternal grandfather and paternal grandmother. Okay. And then Rahu governs a downward look. It implies despair, myopia, being preoccupied or, you know, otherwise engrossed in some limited vision. Okay. On the other hand, K2 governs an upward look. Okay. Which implies aspiration or inspiration, you know, looking to the sky deities for direction or insight. All right. So both Rahu and K2 are considered tall. And amongst the metals, Rahu and Ketu, they rule lead. Okay, they rule the lead metal. Lead, that is not lead, lead. Yeah, in India, we sometimes call it as lead. Yes. So, differentially speaking, Rahu will rule a gate. Okay, Gomed, which is, of course, Hazonite. And uh, Ketu will read, will uh, rule lead or lead, turquoise, cat's eye, okay, cat's eye, and uh, lapis lazuli, okay. By nature, both Rahu and Ketu are natural malefics, and uh, numerology-wise, Rahu rules the number four, while Ketu rules the number seven, okay. And amongst the people, Rahu rules outsiders, you know, governors, Sorry, uh, you know, foreigners, strangers who are who aren't members of the community, okay. But because Rahu also is the duplicate Saturn, it behaves sometimes like duplicate Saturn. It governs people with little or no status in society. For example, the unskilled labor class or the, you know, or the chandalas, the shudras, those people who are thought or who are naturally perceived to be irreligious. So Rahu also governs other undesirable elements of the society, for example, diseased, ex-convicts, gamblers, heretics, hypocrites, illegal immigrants, lepers, and liars, okay? And uh, by a similar logic, K2 also governs other members of society who are marginalized, like mystics, occultists, philosophers, sadhus, prisoners, or victims of suicide, okay? Amongst the places Rahu governs being out and about in the world, you know, it can mean either literally homeless or traveling far from home. Okay. So, you know, traditionally in the Vedic times, 
going to a foreign land was traditionally a death sentence because then you would be exposed to uncomfortable circumstances or even you know perhaps even vulnerable to being attacked okay for example if you look at europe people were exiled from one you know from one country to the other that was traditionally like a death sentence okay people you know this king died in exile that queen died in exile what is exile exile means going to a foreign land where you would be very very vulnerable okay so rahu implies wandering with no fixed address subject to sustained existence in difficult places and also perhaps retreating to the mountains okay it also governs exposure to the elements in difficult environments whether you know whether you, whether you call it as inhospitable surroundings or inclement weather okay so by contrast keto governs places of retreat and rehabilitation like ashrams prisons hospitals and temples okay and uh, by profession both rahu and ketu govern people who handle unsavory things for example you know the meat sellers dealers in hides and skins mortuaries people who work at the mort at the morgues sewage cleaners people working at slaughter houses tanners undertakers okay so it can also both can also represent seers psychics tarot card readers etc okay so rahu rules people who traffic or administer drugs for example liquor store operators drug dealers pharmacists okay that is legal and uh, anesthetologists okay then rahu also governs high tech industries like aeronautics computers and telecommunications it rules the internet something that we are using to communicate right now okay it also favors scientific research especially in medicine antibiotics epidemiology epidemiology okay and vaccines all right so rahu does business with foreigners through immigration import and export international diplomacy foreign exchange and foreign languages okay rahu is also associated with juggling illusion magic and sleight of hand on the other hand ketu represents professions of a higher calling okay like medical practitioners surgeons you know people who practice the occult tantra and also spiritual advisors okay then we come to the psychology of these nodes so on the positive side rahu is associated with imagination independence individuality ingenuity insight inspiration and originality okay on the other and the negative side it is associated with addiction confusion deception delusion escapism illusion neurosis psychosis and vagueness okay so rahu governs stupefaction which means being enthralled in a state of little or no sensibility having the mental faculties benumbed or you know put into a stupor by means of a narcotic okay it represents shock or a strong emotion that makes you physically immobile so rahu is also associated with compulsive or obsessive desires that can lead to a person's downfall for example sex with prostitutes or sex with gigolos yes gambling or other forms of risky behavior that aren't typically sanctioned by the society okay so for k2 on the positive side k2 is associated with compassion idealism impressionability intuition sacrifice spirituality subtlety and universality okay on the negative side its associations include amorality eccentricity emotional turmoil okay explosive behavior fanaticism iconoclasm impulsiveness unconventionality and violence okay so all the terrorists out there who just kill and murder people they have a strong k2 they have a very strong k2 which is negative okay for example suicide bombers just you know blasting themselves and the people around them they will have a very strong k2 which is negative by nature okay so rahu is feminine and it rules sex with divorced or widowed persons okay so some for example some you know someone is marrying a divorced person someone who has not been married before but is now marrying a divorced person in that case that person has a strong rahu okay ketu is neuter 
okay uh, and is uh, ambivalent or disinterested in sexual union that is the reason you know venus finds it very very difficult to be with k2 all right <clears throat> then we have you know uh, the symbols associated with rahu or k2 okay so the symbols of royalty which is the umbrella and the fly whisk it is known as chauri in hindi okay so you know rahu is capable of conferring royalty so rahu is ruled by these symbols okay so by the same you know by the same logic rahu also governs the palanquin palanquin is known in hindi as dola okay so it is a conveyance used by you know brides of the traditional times a conveyance covered on all four sides and typically transported by a you know by a beast of burden for example an elephant or manual labor for example servants or slaves okay so in the olden times four people used to hold the palanquin and they used to transport the bride from her place to the groom's place okay it is known as doli or dola and then ketu is represented as a flag atop a pole okay it is known as the shikha shikha also represents the you know the tuft of hair that priests have on the back of their head okay shikha shikhar shikhar means the highest point of of a mountain here shikhar means the highest point of life so k2 represents that highest point of life okay the highest point of human existence typically all right then both rahu and ketu they covered the periods of eclipses rahu is associated with sunset which is of course the transition from day to night where we are not able to see clearly and this is the time when most accidents occur okay so you know k2 is associated with sunrise which is the transition from night to day and this is the time when we are refreshed after sleep and this is the ideal time for all spiritual practices or studies okay by quality both rahu and ketu are tamasic that means they represent inertia but you know by rahu is very active and by the virtue of its head and fangs and poison it has a great potential to harm okay k2 on the other hand is wrapped up but wants to be free it is headless it wants to be free so you know it can be explosive when released all right so both rahu and k2 they share the quality of tikshna that means sharpness or severity so any person who has his or her personality or the intellect influenced by rahu and ketu can be quite you know quite piercing or penetrating or you know can have can have voice or maybe opinions that can cut through other opinions or other people including you know including their emotions okay so this is about the you know the rulership the general rulership of rahu and ketu okay any doubts still here okay so now we have the yogas that are associated with rahu and ketu okay so all planets they cause yogas yes they are responsible for creating yogas by their placement or conjunction so uh, as uh, chaya grahas or shadow planets rahu and ketu have no physical presence okay so they are more as you know they are mo more regarded as ghost planets okay so they exhibit a shadowy or mysterious presence with the power to disrupt the normal flow of life right and since they are non corporeal they have no explicit ownership of mundane things and uh, you know for this reason bphs says that rahu and ketu can only stay in particular houses but not own them okay so just like a ghost capable of taking the form of your you know of your long departed grandfather the nodes can actually act as proxies for other planets in the chart okay generically what happens is the nodes are malefic okay this is pure and simple the nodes are malefic and uh, there is a classic dictum rahu vat shani ketu vat kuja so what it means is rahu is considered to be like saturn with his cold or airy vata like temperament while ketu is like mars with its hot fiery pitta like disposition okay 
so that is the reason you know aquarius which is also ruled by shani is considered to be the home of rahu while uh, scorpio which is ruled by mars is considered to be the home of ketu okay and aside from their natural affinity for saturn and mars rahu and ketu can also function like lawyers okay you know they can play a proxy role in representing the interests of their clients so you know as it happens in any successful law practice the lawyer is capable of representing more than one client at a time all right so the terms of engagement are relatively simple and you know in this order of in, uh, you know the nodes will act as proxies for other planets having a particular order of influence okay what is that order they will act as proxies for those planets with which they associate by rashi or sign okay they will also they might also act as proxies for those planets which aspect them they also act as proxies for the planet ruling the sign or rashi occupied by them for example if rahu is placed in gemini then it will act as a proxy of mercury okay they also act as proxy of the planet ruling the nakshatra occupied by rahu or ketu okay for example if rahu is placed in punarvasu then it can act as a proxy of jupiter okay and uh, the confluence can be overlapping okay for example in a chart say rahu occupies sagittarius while jupiter is in gemini so we would actually see a strong bias for rahu's representation of jupiter it wants to be like jupiter because why because from gemini jupiter expects rahu and because you know jupiter also disposes rahu yes jupiter disposes rahu because rahu is placed in sagittarius so by these two you know by these two influences or by these two facts factors rahu will tend to be a proxy for jupiter okay so what happens is taking this example further rahu dasha or rahu antar dasha may well manifest as one wherein you know wherein personal circumstances or activities or interactions with the world will largely echo those indicated by the house occupancy and ownership of jupiter okay so you know the nodes have this distinct ability to produce yogas okay either by implicit or explicit involvement with other planets and also with their you know with their ability to act as proxies okay uh so as i said <clears throat> the nodes are very much capable of forming yogas okay for example there is a yoga which is very very fearful it is known as pap kartari yoga okay what is pap kartari yoga pap kartari yoga is formed when malefics are there on both sides of the ascendant okay that means the ascendant is there there is a malefic in the second house there is a malefic in the 12th house so the lagna or the ascendant is sandwiched between these two malefics and it forms a yoga called pap kartari yoga so rahu or ketu can function as one malefic okay occupying the second or the 12th house while another malefic you know like sun or mars or saturn it occupies the other house okay so you know there are there are many many charts where where this combination exists including in my chart okay so i have a 12th house saturn and a second house rahu so this lagna is sandwiched between you know between saturn and rahu okay and pap kartari yoga is very very difficult to overcome take my word for this okay then we have uh, pap adhi yoga pap adhi yoga is formed when uh, malefics occupy the 6th 7th and 8th houses okay for example say mars and saturn is saturn is in the 6th house mars is in the 7th house and rahu or ketu is in the 8th house then it is a pap adhi yoga okay so there are a lot of charts with this combination too all right and then uh, there are few yogas that specifically call for the participation of rahu or ketu okay again it is their malefic nature which holds the key all right for example guru chandala it's a yoga which is formed when <coughs> jupiter and rahu they occupy the same sign okay or you know when jupiter and rahu are mutually aspecting each other yes especially in ninth house in other houses this yoga is not so severe but especially in the ninth house this yoga is very severe okay so why because jupiter is the karaka for dharma gurus and shraddha shraddha means your devotion okay 
Matarahu is an agent of Maya, an instigator of illusions, a proponent of worldly desire and materialism. So Jupiter is sattvic, Rahu is tamasic. So this association between Rahu and Jupiter, it reflects a struggle between your higher and lower natures, between the spiritual and the mundane. Okay. And uh, the actual manifestation of this yoga depends on the house they occupy. But then, you know, in general, this yoga is assumed to create moral conflict with accompanying consequences in behavior. Okay. So, you know, as I said, Guru Chandala becomes worse if it happens in a ninth house because without a ninth house connection, it loses its potency. Because, you know, without the ninth house connection, Jupiter is merely Guru Karaka. Okay. And in, in case if Jupiter was the lord of the ninth house, the yoga would assume a lot of power. Okay. Or if the ninth lord disposits Rahu, then it would reinforce the theme of conflict with Guru. All right. So some of are of the opinion that Jupiter with Ketu also forms Guru Chandala, but then this is not true. In my practical example, you know, in my practical experience, this is not true. Okay. So Jupiter Rahu association, it can mean difficulties between the native and the guru directly. For example, clash of personalities. Okay. But suppose Jupiter and Ketu is associated. What happens is generally I have seen it, you know, it causes problems with the bigger picture. For example, different schools of philosophy difficulty of access to teachings or, you know, or lack of spiritual discipline in general, irrespective of what guru you are learning under. Okay. Then uh, we have Ashta Lakshmi Yoga. Ashta Lakshmi Yoga is formed and Rahu occupies the sixth house with Jupiter in any Kendra. Okay. So Jupiter should be in Kendra and Rahu should be in the sixth house. Okay. So since I'm elephant in the sixth, what happens? It, it usually promises to be good. Okay, but don't take this rule literally because it will also give you very, very terrible enemies. Rahu in the sixth, it means you have terrible enemies. Okay, but at the end, it promises triumph towards, you know, over your competition. But this is, you know, this is Ash Lakshmi Yoga. It is seen as a prosperity inducing combination. Okay, it gives not, not only wealth, it also gives a lot of courage, education, land, progeny, etc. Okay. Then we have the Mahapataka Yoga. Mahapataka Yoga is formed when moon associates with Rahu and is expected by Jupiter that is under influence of another malefic. Okay. So these are very particular yogas. All right. Moon has to associate with Rahu by conjunction or aspect and it has to be aspected by Jupiter that is under a malefic association. So as a Karaka for the mind, moon's association with Rahu corrupts one's thinking. Okay. And, you know, the aspect of a weak Jupiter on the moon provides opportunity for unethical behavior, which is restrained by good judgment. If you remember the story, Chandra eloped with Tara, who was the wife of Jupiter. Okay. So this is actually seen as the mark of a wicked sinner. Yes, it is seen as the mark of a wicked sinner. All right. All right. So we stop here today. We'll continue with the Raja Yogas that are formed by the nodes in the next class. Okay. So any questions still here? Do yogas fructify in D9? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Okay. You have to see yogas in all the charts. All right, then. I don't think we have any questions or more questions, rather. Okay, fair enough. So, thank you guys for joining in. I'll see you tomorrow in the Jyotish Foundation class. And happy weekend to all of you and happy learning as well. Okay, so we have the Chat Puja, Chat Puja coming up tomorrow in India. So, this is one Vedic practice that has remained throughout, you know, through thick and thin, basically. So just say thank you to the sun, even if you're not participating in Chat Puja, just say thank you to the sun for nourishing you in this world and keeping you nourished. Okay, because we are all there because of the sun. We are there because the sun is. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I'll see you tomorrow in the class. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Happy Chat Puja to you too.